I want I want to offer the opportunity to show someone that having a job doesn't need to look like a nine to five in an office building. It can be practicing your culture every day. It can be like learning how to bead, learning how to tough, learning how to tan hides. That could be your job. Hey everyone, welcome to Venture Out, a podcast series from Entrepreneur that shares the brave stories of Northerners who are inspiring innovation and community well being through business. I'm your host, Zena Cowan. We are fires across the tundra. We are ice of a million years. Our mothers, our fathers hold us. We stand together. Today, I'm talking to two brilliant women who are full time artists and jewelers. They've both successfully built a business around their creative practice. And the best part is they lift each other up every day, even though they live thousands of miles apart. If you live in the North, you probably know Tanya Larson and her work. And if you don't live in the North, I think there's still a good chance that you know Tanya's name if you're tapped into the Indigenous fashion community. Her jewelry designs are really distinct, and she's also a very strong advocate of Indigenous entrepreneurship. For two years, Tanya apprenticed under renowned jeweler Carrie Atombi. This experience completely transformed both women's lives, and today they're like sisters. In this episode, Tanya and Carrie share what this mentorship has given to them, and they also talk about some other really interesting topics like developing cultural confidence, redefining wealth, and how they approach storytelling. I have so much respect for these two women, and I love how they operate. And hearing them talk about each other really affirms my feeling that strong mentorship is a gift, not only for entrepreneurs, but really for anybody who's doing the work to grow. Before we dive in, here's a quick background on Tanya and Carrie. Tanya designs Gwich and Fine jewelry created with land-based materials. She's a graduate of the Institute of American Indian Arts, IAIA, where she met her mentor, Carrie. She's Gwich'in in Swedish and moved to the Northwest Territories from France at 15. Her late mother, Shirley Firth, was born on the trapline in Eklavik and went on to become a four-time Olympian. Today, Tanya is internationally recognized as a jeweler and high tanner, and her work has appeared in publications like Vogue. Carrie is a renowned Kiowa artist and jeweler. Her works have been featured in exhibits and permanent collections at the Heard Museum, Minneapolis Institute of Art, Peabody Essex Museum, Philbrook Museum of Art, and the Smithsonian. In 2015, she and her sister, Terry Greaves, were honored as living treasures by the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The first part of this episode is my conversation with Tanya, and the second part is with Carrie. Lots of good visiting, so let's get into it. Welcome, Tanya. I'm super excited to be speaking with you today and can't wait to hear about where you're at these days with your business. Do you want to start by introducing yourself? Dren Gwinzi. Uh, my name is Tanya Larson. I'm a Gwich'in fine jeweler. Um, I'm based out of Yellowknife Northwest Territories and I sell 
jewelry online under uh, my website, tanyalarson.com. Beautiful. Tanya, I know that your business has taken you on a really incredible journey and that a lot has happened for you, especially in the last couple of years. Curious, when you were initially designing jewelry and first making pieces, what was your initial intention or goal? I wanted to be able to wear something on my body as a cultural indicator of where I was from. And so, you know, indigenous jewelry, uh, when you ask, like when you think of what does indigenous jewelry look like, you'll probably think of, you know, turquoise from the Southwest or maybe uh, feather earrings or maybe, um, you know, beaded fringe earrings. And, uh, or even like those huge powwow blingy earrings. <laughs> um, I wanted to create jewelry where when you looked at it, you're like, uh-huh, this person, you know, is probably Gwich'in or this person is, you know, indigenous from the North. So I wanted to really include those elements and make sure that that connection to the land that is so deep in our culture up north is embedded in those adornments and to really shine a light on how important uh, those elements are to our traditions and how much we value that work. Tanya, I know you and I know that uh, you put a lot of thought into everything you do. You love to research and go down rabbit holes. Can you talk a little bit about the learning journey that you uh, went on and got to a place where you felt really ready to launch your business? Absolutely. This was not overnight. This was, this took me a long time to, um, to figure it out because as a teenager, you want to, you know, be unique and have an identity and like, where do you belong to? Which crew are you from? Like all that kind of stuff. And so for me, I wanted to be able to wear jewelry. And so I started small. I started with like fringe earrings and then I started doing some beadwork on moose hide. I used leather and studs because I love Jamie Okuma's work. And then I really wanted to answer that question what does, you know, Gwich'in jewelry look like? Because I know it's not the, those like super flashy, like candy earrings or, or, or those, those kinds of designs that are very like stylish from the South. And I'm like, like, what is it? Like, I want to know, like, when you think of adornment, you think of, you know, the grannies walking down the street with their little hankies over their head, that little pleated, you know, blue dress with the, you know, the tights and the, the, muck, the mucklucks or moccasins with the, um, you know, the black rubbers over it. And they're walking down the street. I was like, you know, that is stylish. You see, you know, the drummers that have those beautiful vests, their moccasins, I have their, their shirt on with their jeans and they're just like, just singing for hours and they look on point. And I'm like, that is stylish. How do I capture that and create something that when people see the work, they will say, that's stylish, that's from the North. I see myself in those pieces. To figure that out took me years. To get the skills took me years. And I went the long route, not only 
that I had to build my own confidence as a, as a Gwich'in woman, but also as a Gwich'in woman that was born and raised in France. Like I moved to the North when I was 15 years old. And so oftentimes people will say, you're not Gwich'in, you're not from here. Like people who have hurt that they're carrying, you know, and I realized that, huh, if the only thing you can accuse me of is you're not Gwich'in, I must be doing something really right. <laughs> because um, I know I'm changing the way things are done. And I know that I'm also really upholding how things have been done for thousands of years. So it's kind of like <laughs> a balance. And it's like, how do you honor your culture and take that responsibility, yet create a new product that supports it and that supports the resurgence of our culture and our pride in being Indigenous today? Wow, that's such a huge shift for a 15-year-old. What was it that drew you home to the North? Um, well, we actually moved here because... I wanted to learn my culture more. I wanted to like become closer to my family. Uh, my mom was born, you know, on the land in the Arctic um, in a Klavik. Her parents had a dog team. Um, her dad was a trapper. Her mom was like an amazing sewer. Uh, and so, yeah, my mom, you know, her name is Shirley Firth. She became an Olympian and traveled the world, but she had a very strong connection to where she came from. Her, um, her mom, Fanny Rose Greenland and her, her dad, Stephen Firth were, you know, they had, 12 children <laughs> and like the you know like the mem her favorite memories was like being next to the Mackenzie River listening to all the like icicle chime in the water during breakup during the spring season and I always wondered what that sounded like I was like because I don't know I've never experienced that And like all the kids before they were five, they knew how to snare rabbits, they knew how to trap animals. So that there is that love and connection to the land that is so strong that made me want to experience that. What was the hardest was actually accessing my culture. And I thought that moving across the ocean from Europe to Northern Canada, it would be way easier to, to access it. And it wasn't. And so then I had to learn about like things you don't really learn about in a way that's like colonization. Residential school was brought up, like was talked about in the press like two years after I moved and I had no idea what that meant I had no idea the impact of these laws and policies put in place by the Canadian government to assimilate us and eradicate our communities our relationships to the land our relationships to each other and really our pride in being who we are today and so um there was lots, there's a huge learning curves in those aspects to then like 
getting having so much anger and I'm a person that can't really deal with anger so it's like how can I create something instead of just opposing something and so creating something is creating relationships asking questions working on the land understanding what working on the land means understanding what tanning hides was beadwork all those kind of things and so it was not an easy task but it's a lifelong journey and I'm so happy that I'm doing it. I really love what you're saying about putting your energy into creating something and that being your response to everything that you were learning and experiencing about colonization and also the beauty of your Gwich'in culture. How did you first begin to do that creative work? I think the initial steps uh, was gaining cultural confidence in being a Gwich'in woman. So it was learning how to tan hides. <laughs> learning how to tan hides was a steep curve. Uh, but it was then from that point, once I tanned my first hide, I felt confident enough to go to an art school. And so I went in jewelry and then I did an apprenticeship with um, a goldsmith, uh, Carrie Tumby, And that was for two years. And it was like building those relationships. And she really took me under her wing to understand like how to run a business kind of thing. What do you have to do? How do you take care of your customers? How do you design? What are you trying to say through your, through your designs? How does it fit on the like all these questions that you might not know so like that mentorship that community whether it's like elders who are teaching me like how to get spruce boughs or how to chop uh <laughs> like wood like all of these people played a part in me starting to become an entrepreneur and so once I graduated school like my goal was I'm not going to work for the government I'm not going to put on those you know we call them those gold um golden handcuffs um because it pays so much but at the same time it sucks your soul because sometimes it's really hard to to fit in a system when you're not meant to fit in a box Okay, I want to go back to that mentorship piece with Carrie, but before we do, let's unpack the hide tanning because it is such a core part of everything you do and it's woven into your business model and how you spend time with community on the land. And now there are customers all over the world who are wearing Tanya Larson earrings that are made from hide that you've smoked and tanned yourself and with the support of community. What is the process from start to finish of tanning a hide? Okay, so <laughs> even though it sounds like a very easy question, it's a very hard <laughs> answer as like, what does it take to tan a hide? So you need the conditions on like the land to be really good for that animal to give itself to you as the hunter. And then the hunter need to be skilled so that they can skin the, the animal properly because you want them to take their time and be very conscious about their knife marks. Then you need to be able to have a connection with that hunter to get not only the skin, but you also want probably you know, the brain and probably the the front bones, like the shin bones 
of the animal so you can make your own tools. So then you need tools. <laughs> um, but if you're starting, you probably need someone that's very knowledgeable. So uh, we, th we so sought out um, an elder who could like, you know, teach, but you also need friends to help you because it's a huge undertaking. So this job is actually a community job because you need more than one. It's not like an individualistic uh, undertaking. So that's super interesting. And then you need tons of patience. You need amazing <laughs> finger muscles, hand muscles, forearm muscles, triceps, back muscles, <laughs> traps, um, and strength, endurance, and mental strength to actually tan a heart because it will challenge you in every aspect of your being until you can get it to a really soft part to do the final smoke. It's completely changing your worldview and challenging really your worldview of like, this activity is going to fit in my schedule. You have to think about seasons and then you have to see the skins. You have to hear how you're scraping it. You're experiencing through so many different senses and then it's done. And then you're like, holy moly, I don't know if I ever want to do it again, or I just want to start out right away before I forget everything I just learned. So that's why I'm like, it's hard to answer the question. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm in awe. And hearing you share that labor of love really helps me to understand just how much work goes into creating your pieces. And it also validates your pricing because all of the blood, sweat, and tears takes you hours and hours. Do you remember how you felt the first time that you completed a hide? I was so exhausted. Like every part of my body was sore and I was done. Uh, but I was also like all the hard work just disappeared. It's like, you know, when you hear women saying giving birth and after everything, you see your baby and then you forget all that pain. <laughs> and then that's how it feels like you're finally done, like all that work. And you're just like, you just honored that animal spirit. You just honored their, their existence and you've made something with their skin and now you can put it out in the world and it's like it's such a powerful feeling and it's such a humbling feeling and it's just pure bliss so it's it's definitely beautiful Now, let's talk about art school. You went to the prestigious Institute of American Indian Arts, IAIA, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and that's where you met Carrie. I want to hear all about your relationship with her. Um, well, I first, I think I first met Carrie when she became my jewelry instructor for my intro to jewelry. And um, it was... Like she was really challenging and like really wanted to see your research and your thought process and your designs and why are you doing the things you're doing like are you just copying can you take like look at something but make it your own why do you want to use this process why do you want to use this technique why do you want to use like 
um, you know, these influences, but she teaches, like, she taught me how to like, go look at references and not just take it, but like making it your own. And how can you do that? And I think for me, that was super important um, because oftentimes you're not taught that. She didn't accept me as her apprentice right away. Like she didn't, like, it was not overnight being like, hey, can I be your apprentice? It, like it took some time to vet me. I think it was over a year and a half, even after I was her student. For me, that relationship became, you know, she was my mentor and then she was my friend and then she became like my older sister. And so it's like, we are going to be in each other's lives for the rest of our life. It's such a powerful relationship. And I know that I'm honoring her by saying her name. And I think that's important whenever you, you like go you know, on in the world as if you've ever been inspired by someone or like you've been gifted the time or like techniques or stuff like it's always important to honor them. And one way of doing that is just saying their name. And that's how you leave a strong legacy. It's like you talk about those people and those people will live a long time through you and your work. And what I'm what a beautiful gift to give back to the people who've mentored you and helped shape you as an artist. That's really powerful. And it sounds like Carrie has been instrumental in all areas of your professional and personal development. And I know that she feels the same. And she actually refers to you as her mentor as well. And it's such a, a gorgeous example of how important mentorship is for artists and for entrepreneurs. And in, in a perfect world, everybody would have a Carrie right? When I spoke to her, we talked about pricing quite a bit. And as you know, it's a tough area that all entrepreneurs have to work through. Tell me about your very first collection drop and how you priced those pieces. <laughs> my initial pieces were like my initial pieces on my first few drop were beautifully made high quality jewelry that was so underpriced <laughs> like I had tanned all of those hides by hand I had cut all of the antlers and sanded them and polished them so beautifully it was all vintage beads I had done all the components by hand meaning like I took silver wire and created my own ear hooks and everything like that and I remember like there I had prized them so little because I just did not know how to do how to do it better yeah it was it was definitely a learning curve but I was so happy to see how crazy it was because I had launched the weekend after Black Friday which happens to be the worst weekend to launch an online website <laughs> but I had no idea and I had done it like on Sunday night I had done it on a full moon I remember that um, and it just 
like sold out like I woke up the next morning and everything was gone and I was like oh my god like I can't believe this is happening and then I was like well I I thought I had worked so hard but I'm I'm gonna do another sale on Thursday and then same that one like sold out in less than an hour and it had so many pieces and I was like this is crazy I can't believe this is this is happening and um I just kept on working so hard at creating these pieces and I did a lot of work like all by myself and then I was just burnt I was like like already burnt out because I was like working so hard but I could not even like afford to go you know get a coffee (laughs) like stuff like that because I was just not pricing my work appropriately and so once I found the courage to change that. And a lot of that was through the entrepreneurs program was understanding pricing, understanding the value, understanding what I'm giving to the world and pricing it appropriately because it was about honoring yourself and your work, the materials that you're doing and your community. Yeah, I think there's this misconception that if I raise my prices, my customers will be upset with me and they won't want to buy my things anymore, blah, blah, blah. But we just know that that's not true and that it partially comes from this place of fear and even scarcity. No, it's uh, like if you raise your prices, it's, and you ha- there's so many things to consider. The material you're using, the processes you're using, what the market can bear, how do you share your story? All of these things are super important. And then seeing who your customer is. And like, sometimes people try to shame artists being like, well, if you as an artist can't even afford your own work, like, is it really fair to do that? And I'm like, yes, it is fair because it's okay that I can't like afford my own work because my priorities are different and I don't have maybe generational wealth, but I have time, I have skills, I have community and that's the wealth that I want to be, you know, like that I want. And so if selling my work to someone who can afford it allows me to be able to really build my wealth in relationship and spending time on the land and researching, that has a stronger impact for my community than to be able to have a piece from me. And so it was really decide, like taking those decisions as an artist, but also as an entrepreneur and deciding what kind of impact you wanna have in the world. And there's no, you know, right or wrong answers. And you cannot please everybody. You really have to be clear with yourself. Like, what do I want to do? Am I achieving it? Or can I push the boundaries still? Part of what I love about you is how intentional you are about your decisions as an entrepreneur, and you're really clear on what impact and wealth means to you. Um, You define it for yourself. You don't have to take on anybody else's definition. And I know that um, there's this uh, growth 
process that you're going through right now, and it's a really exciting evolution of your business and you as an artist. Can you share a little bit about where you're planning to take things? There's a lot in the works uh, for me, um, but I really want to work with other people. I no longer want TanyaLarson.com to just be me and only me because I think that there's so many incredible artists in all our communities who have such beautiful skills and artistry um, that I could be supporting and they could support me. And I think that's what the beauty about entrepreneurship is like whenever people work with you they invest in your company as much as you invest in them and their community and i know that in the north like whenever you bring in a dollar in a community like it generates something like seven dollars so that's the power of entrepreneurship especially in the north it's like if someone's investing in my product and i'm reinvesting it into my people and people who are in smaller communities where there's very little um, job opportunity, then I'm having a super big impact. There's just so much to look forward to. And what you're describing is a huge long game impact journey that involves everybody, including your customers. And you're giving the opportunity for everybody to come along for the ride. Clearly, you're building and elevating a business model that really values relationships in the land and local capacity building. Tell me more about that. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, uh, it looks different <laughs> than most businesses because like as soon as pr spring comes up like I need to be cleaning my hides I need to be softening them I need to do that and if I don't prioritize that I will not have the materials to create my work in that next year and then so you're like how do you like make I can't make more pieces if I don't have high quality hides so how do you do that you have to teach more people how to tan hide so that they can start doing the work so that in the future you could purchase from them. <laughs> so it's like seeing your business, not in a one, five, 10 years, but it's like 50 years from today, who am I going to purchase my hides from and know that they're high quality? That's a super important question for me. And I need to make sure that every year I spend that time teaching more people or like like inspire more people to do that work and so you know it's 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 it looks different you know and even if it's like like I like working you know with with uh, people in high school to do like work after hours um, so that they can help me around my studio and stuff like that and I want, I want to offer the opportunity to show someone that having a job doesn't need to look like a nine to five in an office building. It can be practicing your culture every day. It can be like learning how to bead, learning how to tuft, learning how to tan hides. That could be your job. It's it's a it's a different way of doing business, and I think that it's okay to move away from traditional business because what does that support? And what kind of worldviews does that support? Yeah. <laughs> Peace was the word when you first learned how to see Now it's so cold the way we view everything Love it sustains the hope and light, light in your soul Giving your family and your friends something to hold Is 
That was Den and Day's Jay Gilday performing his song, Edge of the World. I'm always really struck by Tanya's commitment to innovation and excellence. She's always pushing the envelope. And I know that she's gotten that spark from lots of people in her life, including her mom and Carrie, her mentor. This next part of the episode is my interview with Carrie, and we connected over Zoom. She was in her studio in Surrios Hills, which is a little outside of Santa Fe, and I think Carrie just has this electric energy and this deep desire to be an anti of the world. And that's what she is for Tanya and for lots of other jewelers and artists in the Indigenous arts community.
Carrie, it's such an honor to be speaking to you. Um, I'm feeling a little starstruck, actually, and I'm so glad that you've decided to zoom in with us from your gorgeous studio. Um, can you remember what it was like when you first met Tanya? How did that happen? Oh, yeah, I do. I um, So my friend, uh, um, who was, his name is Mark, he was the professor, jewelry professor, professor over at the Institute of American Indian Arts here in Santa Fe. And he and his wife were needed to take some time off and for personal reasons. And so he asked me if I'd be willing to take over one of his classes and which I teach very rarely, but, um, and I, I love to teach, but it's like, I, you know, you can't do everything. You, and so I said, yeah, sure. I'll do that. And I got in the class. My, one of my questions, you know, you introduce everyone, have everyone introduce themselves and what's your goals and why are you in this class? And I was writing notes frantically because I'm trying to remember everyone's names and whatever. And I heard someone and she was talking away and she was Gwich'in and she was from up North and it, I, I, I'll just do a little plug for them, is an extraordinary school. One of the reasons why it's an extraordinary school is because the diversity of the, of the student population. And there's people from all different, it's a really truly an international school. There are so many people from many, many different nations and they're all, you learn so much from the students teaching there as much as the students learn from the, from the, um, and, the and also the diversity of ages. So I'm listening to all these people talk and she says, she's the singular person in that class who says, I want to be a jeweler. And I tell you, I gave myself whiplash. My head flipped up because I was like, which one of you said that? And I was like, and I looked and she was, I was like, okay, you. Because to me, what I was hearing, Jewelry 101, how can I help each of these individuals? Not everyone's going to be a jeweler. And some people want to just make a pair of earrings. That's fine. And I'm totally like, I love that. But when I hear, I want to be a jeweler, I, you know, I was like, yeah, how can I help you? And then so that over that semester, we, um, we, uh, I got to see her and I saw how serious she was as, as a student. And she, we talked to her at the end of the semester, she asked me if she could be, um, do an uh, internship with me. And I said, yes. And then I, I basically vetted her for about two years and, uh, um, and kept checking back in with IAI. What's happening with that one student? What's happening with that one student? What's, what's she doing? And when, when I felt like she was like, uh, and then I had a list of rules of what she could do when she got to my studio. By the end of her internship with me, she literally had moved in almost to the, my my uh, spare bedroom. <laughs> and like, she's my little sister. At this point, she's my little sister. That's so beautiful. What a gift that you both have that. We talk about mentorship a lot with the entrepreneurs that we work with here in the North. And just curious about your approach to mentorship what has that work looked like with you and Tanya? I, I understood that from a very young age as being an auntie. Like, what is it? I'm an auntie of the world. I didn't have my own children. And I made that decision as a young woman to not have my own children, to be an auntie of the world. And what that means is, you know, I have responsibility over my, over my blood nephews, but what that means to the rest of like the, 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 the world, like what, you know, what did my mom teach me? What does an auntie actually mean? And when I looked at my aunties, who are not blood relatives, they're Shoshone women, because like I said, I grew up amongst the, the uh, in, up in Wyoming, and what my aunties did for me and how much they taught me. So that's what that's where I was taking my, my cues from, is how to be a, a mentor at, for Tanya. And one of the things that I heard somewhere along the way is that if you don't have, if you're over the age of, 40 and you don't have a mentor who's 20 and young, you know, under, under the age of 30, you're really missing out on something. And I looked at my mom's life. My mom passed away about six years ago, but I looked at my mom's life and how, what an extraordinary woman she is, was, is, it was. And uh, um, she was taking classes and she had 20 year old mentors until the day she died at the age of 82. And I was, she was vivacious and alive, engaged in the world. And that to me was, is, is what I feel like mentoring is rooted in for me at least. So what I learned from Tanya is a number of things. Um, Tanya is a very, very smart woman and I'm honored to have had have her as my mentor and as my friend and, and family member. So her honoring that like the materials is really, really key. She really honors the materials and the, and the traditional techniques that went that go into her work, and what I'm, what I was, what I was trying to do, or what I try to do in my work is, 
again, like a bridge person. So bridging, bridging between indigenous, what we find valuable as indigenous people and what non-native people find valuable. So non-native people think of jewelry as diamonds and gold and rubies and emeralds and all of that, which I love all of that. What we find value, valuable are ermine and porcupines and brain tan hide and the water that feeds and those ermine and all of that. So we have this, that sort of sense. And, and I wanted to put them together to present that to maybe make people's little light bulbs go off in their head that, oh, maybe water and porcupines are just as valuable as gold and diamonds. If you, so, so that, what I learned from Tanya is, um, and I think we sort of did this together when in our time together is that I, I, she, as a younger person, gave me permission to actually just go for it and to do that. Because previous to that, I had, had been in this place where, you know, I'm making jewelry, but in order to sell it, I have to, you know, make it look the certain way. So, and I always, you know, I'd make things for my sister, I'd make things for my mom that had this other element to it with the shells, with the diamonds in it. And I was like, oh, well, that's just for mom and my sister and, you know, for my family members, because no one else is going to get it. So what I learned from Tanya was actual permission to, to go there and to say, you know, like, what are you, what are you going to do with your life, right? <laughs> is such an important conversation and I'm glad that you and Tanya have explored this too together because she's brought it into the entrepreneur classroom and we know that there's so much value in authentic storytelling and really tapping into your self-worth and when you have that as an artist you can confidently explain to somebody you know, this is why my earrings are $400 and not $80. What you're talking about is value systems. And that's what I'm, you know, so the earrings that I make with porcupine quills and, and sapphires, that's talking to that exact same thing. We as Native people don't value ourselves because look at how, at least in this country, the U.S. government, and it's the same up there in Canada, how the government, how colonizers valued us. We're not people. We weren't people, my grandma, you know, my grandmother didn't like, my mother got taken out of her home and put into residential school to be trained as a servant because that's what all she was good for, right? In their eyes. So generational trauma, all of that like comes into how, how we value ourselves. And, you know, my friend also told me once I was, she said this, I thought this is the greatest fucking phrase. She said, look, just keep telling yourself, fail like a mediocre white man, right? They don't fail. They don't fail. Oh, oh, that didn't work out. No problem. Here's more money here. Just like start up again. They just water off a duck's back. Fail like a mediocre white man. That porcupine is just as valuable as that sapphire. And the reason it's just as valuable, and I'll tell you the story, it, it, um, it happened at a, a big market here. And these clients who are very, 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 very influential, very wealthy people, and they bought from all, all tons of us, and they've been very helpful for native for native artists because they brought help bring bring native art into, you know, the art world in New York and the art world in like in the non-native vision of like, oh, this is actual fine art too. So they've been very helpful in that. In having said that, they come to my booth and I had a, a, this incredible bracelet that Jamie Okuma and I made together. She did this micro beadwork on the inside. It had a buffalo on the inside. I had completely surrounded it with, um, with I, I forget, it was either diamonds or gray sapphires. And, um, and it was all in gold and silver and then the medallion part. And then the bracelet was, was horn work, you know, and you guys do a lot of that horn work and it is difficult to do. It's stinky. It takes a long time making a bracelet. You have to make a jig, you have to boil it. You have to move it slowly. It's like, it is very labor. Like that bracelet part was, you know, there was the big flashy thing on top, but the bracelet part, which was super simple, just horn. And he was like, oh, 
I can't buy this. Oh, oh, I can't buy this. And then he was like, let me write you down. And he writes down a, a number on a piece of paper. Like, I mean, what the fuck are we in some like, like, like movie or something? He writes down this number and hands it to me. And I look at it and he's literally offered me half, like, half, like half, less than wholesale, less than wholesale. And he said, well, I just can't, I can't pay that much for horn. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> excuse me, like, where are the buffalo? Let's look for buffalo. Let's look for, where are they on this, Where and why aren't they on this country? From your answer, or like, I just got on him because I was like, these are, they're not here, and this is what's valuable. This is the example that this, that that horn is more valuable than those diamonds because there's no water, because they're not here anymore, because they were almost driven to extinction. You know, like that, so that was my, there's my story. He didn't buy it, but then I got sold it to some other lady who was just the loveliest, wonderfulest lady ever. And she was like, completely got it and was like, so it took me great pleasure to say, to let him know, oh yes, no, that's not available anymore. Thank you very much. Oh yeah, so satisfying. Uh, it's funny, I've talked with Tanya quite a bit about her ideal customers and she describes them as people who not only respect her work, but her personhood and her values. And they really have respect for her time and their pricing. And they understand the worth of the materials that she uses. They just don't question them like that guy. And I'll tell you, my, my ideal customer is the person who didn't know that, but after talking to you or after seeing your work goes there. Because that to me is like, that's the educational part. And that I, I learned from my mom who dressed in native clothing every single day of her life. And it used to be a pain in the butt to go to the grocery store with her because everyone had to go, oh, what are you, you know, cause she was, she, you know, I mean, she, and she dressed it, she dressed up fancy to go out to fancy places, but it was all always the tea dress, you know, the, the native way of dress, native art for our native way of dressing. But what she was doing was she was educating on a very grassroots level. She did not discriminate between the fancy person at, and she would go to ambassadors' houses and like whatever, or Joe Blow in the grocery store. If Joe Blow in the grocery store wanted to come up and talk to her about why are you, what are you, who are you? What, Cause you know, she was stunning and she looked super native and she would stop and she'd say, well, I'm Kiowa and she would explain and blah, blah, blah. And it was like that grassroots education. Like, you know, like we're gonna like, indigenize the world, one pair of earrings at a time, you know, that kind of feeling. And it's like, so that's my ideal client is somebody who maybe doesn't know anything, but then comes up and after talking has a, has a certain amount of um, uh, curiosity spur sparked inside of them. And, you know, gets that aha moment of like, oh yeah, maybe that porcupine is as valuable as that gold, you know, maybe, maybe it's more valuable because it, requires the water and the air and all of that that we all need to keep this planet functioning. Your mom sounds like a truly extraordinary woman filled with integrity and empathy. And now you get to carry that forward and pass it on to people like Tanya, which is so inspiring. So I want to thank you, Carrie, for taking the time to share with us so generously today. And as you know, Tanya's embarking on this exciting new chapter in her life, and I'm sure when she's ready, she'll share more details with all of her customers and her community base, you know, her 17,000 plus followers on Instagram. But for the time being, we just know that big things are on the horizon for her. Do you have a message of love for Tanya that you'd like to share with her? Oh, I'm going to cry. Tanya, I love you so much. You make me proud, but not only do you make me proud, I know that my mom is proud of you, your mama is proud of you, and all of those women who've come before us are proud of you. You are such a smart person, such an inspiring person, and such a creative person. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you be in my life.
Like, I think at the end of the day, what is so important for entrepreneurs is realizing the gifts that they have to offer the world and how powerful and unique their view, their worldviews can influence how they problem solve and how that is such a strength and uniqueness that other people just can never like experience. And so it's like, what's important is really building that confidence because like what happens when you think differently or when you experience the world differently or see the world differently than the majority is that throughout your life, people will probably have tried to dim your lights. They've probably had tried to put you back in your place, like the patriarchy loves to say. And so it's so important to realize the unique gift you have to offer the world. The world. And it can be in any subjects. And if you can problem solve something in a good way, that's what you can offer and create a business around. And I think that if I knew that that's what was entrepreneurship and really pushed those ideas, like I think a lot more people could be um, entrepreneurs in the North. And always remembering that if an Indigenous person, status Indian, wanted to own or run a business, like wanted to, yeah, own a business, they had to give up their status. They had to like check whites in their, in the box, you know, because of the the policies implemented by the government of Canada. And so, you know, some people had to choose between running a business and being indigenous uh, in the, on paper. And so like imagine how that has impacted our communities and, you know, just remember that today you don't need anyone's authorization. You don't have to hand in your identity papers so that you can run a business. And so like just your existence and on top of that, running a business, like that is so powerful. That is such a huge statement. Thanks so much for listening today. I hope you found inspiration in Tanya and Carrie's messages and maybe some curiosity was sparked and you now have some new questions that you want to go and explore. Part of what I love about these two women is how generously they share their experiences and creative process and they do a lot of this through social media. So if you haven't already, go follow Tanya Larson and Carrie Atambi on Instagram. They use the platform to spark really exciting conversations, and they're also always promoting other Indigenous artists. So get ready to go down some very designy rabbit holes. If you want to be the first to know about their latest collection or an upcoming sale, I highly recommend getting on their newsletter list. And you can sign up through their websites, and we will post the links to their sites in our show notes. Venture Out's production team includes myself and Travis Mercredi. Our theme song is called Fires Across the Tundra, and it's by the one and only Den and Day's Leela Gilday. Today's episode also featured the track Edge of the World by Jay Gilday, who is indeed Leela's brother. It's a small world. Our next episode features one of the coolest dudes I have ever met, 
Nux Lindell, who is the lead designer of Hinani Design, an Inuit-owned apparel brand based out of Arviet, Nunavut. Nux has an amazing life story with lots of twists and turns, and he tells it so well. So be sure to tune in. You can find Venture Out on all your favorite podcast platforms, and if you like what you're hearing, please give us a rating. We'd love to hear from you, so reach out on Entrepreneurs Instagram and Facebook, or you can send us an email at podcast at entrepreneurth.ca. See you next time. We are part of the crowd.